now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today, I'm going to be talking about a number of issues, uh, artificial intelligence, about what's been described as the Aramanic, uh, Araman, Demiurge, what it go, uh, Luciferian force, call it what you will. Uh, recently, there was a brilliant discussion between uh, Masaki Miyagawa and Meredith, and they had a great discussion about this very subject, the Aramanic uh, adversarial force of, of evil. And uh, I'll provide a link to that discussion because I, I think really people would benefit by plugging into that. And another recent podcast that actually aligns in some respects with the aforementioned discussion between Meredith and Masaki was a recent uh, situation update uh, from Mike Adams. And it was the situation update about, and I'm, I'm reading the uh, the entry on his website, Natural News. A Harvard scientist Dr. Charles Lieber, nanowires, DOD, CCP, Wuhan, COVID, 5G, carbon nanotubes, military vaccines, spike ferritin nanoparticles, and more. He, Mike Adams, brought out some key issues in that uh, situation update. And, then, and I'll go into more detail later, but when he talked about uh, synthetic iron essentially supplanting and replacing the iron within human beings, I, I darn near fell out of my seat because uh, those that are deeply, deeply involved in alien abduction research knows that one side effect, if you will, of alien encounters, alien abductions, but also attacks from alien craft getting zapped by beams of light, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, one outcome of that, well documented, is the loss of iron uh, from the subject. Uh, their iron is uh, basically uh, removed somehow from their body as a result of these some of these experiences. This is, doesn't happen to everyone. It uh, doesn't happen every time someone has an ET encounter, but uh, there have been uh, numerous instances where there has been a loss of iron within the subjects who've had the encounters, or as, as in the case of, in Brazil and probably elsewhere around the world when people have been attacked by these uh, alien craft uh, zapped with beams of light. A marked outcome of that uh, from a physiological biochemistry perspective was the loss of iron and I had Steve Mira on uh, this show in the past and and he talked about this and th then we got into a discussion about how how difficult it is to just get good old-fashioned iron ore these days and how in nature and I've seen this myself uh, if a dog is feeling at a subconscious, intuitive level, whatever the case may be, that they're deficient in iron, what do they do? They start eating dirt, they start eating soil, uh, because they know that's what their body needs, right? And as human beings, uh, the supplements that are sold in a lot of the mainstream pharmacies and supermarkets, what have you, that are labeled as iron supplements are not very helpful at all. Uh, you have to go out and source quality iron supplements and also make the uh, eating of iron rich vegetables part of your diet. Uh, it seems to me if, if the forces that are arrayed against this, uh, human and non-human, uh, particularly the latter, are hell-bent on removing iron from our bodies and then now replacing it with, you know, these chimerical injections 
And within the injections themselves, there is this aspect of uh, some synthetic iron. And to me, when I hear the term synthetic, synthetic iron, that tells me that someone or something wants to supplant or uh, replace the existing iron in our body with a synthetic form of it, right? And it's all tied in with the uh, nanoparticles, the research of Dr. Charles Lieber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure it goes much deeper than Lieber. What I believe is happening with this worldwide roll, rollout of these treatments is that uh, at long last, the the true face of this global agenda has, has manifested. For those with the eyes to see, the ears to hear, uh, to this day there are still people who uh, mock and ridicule and marginalize the whole notion of alien abductions, and uh, particularly the reptilians, and that was the case even within the UFO community. These so-called experts would be dismissive about reptilians. Oh, the lizard people, go talk to Barbara Barthelk about that. That's what Bud Hopkins used to say, in a very dismissive way, I might add. Uh, and to this day, there are people that just are totally dismissive of it. And it's gotten to the point now, and this is how I feel about it. No one else has to feel about it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, if at this late stage of the game, these so-called truthers think that this is just power-mad bankers and power-mad people in these secret societies that are behind all this, uh, they're... They're sadly mistaken, and even worse, when they get up on a soapbox and say, oh, any suggestion or notion of reptilians and aliens behind this, that disinformation, you see, that's crappy, piss-poor research, all right? Just Roswell alone, the Roswell case alone is the case that makes the case of alien intervention here on Earth, just, just that case alone, and how many of these debunkers and uh, people who are trying to marginalize the subject of the alien res uh, responsibility for for all this. How many of them have actually even done the basic research on Roswell alone, let alone uh, the countless examples of alien abduction, of encounters of reptilians? And, and this long predates the... Uh, the work of David Icke, uh, and I give credit where credit's due, with David Icke has probably done more than anyone to get the concept of reptilians into the public consciousness, but he was not the first. Uh, there were many people laboring behind the scenes, uh, not even really making an effort to get it out to the mainstream, just working in private, uh, private investigators, trying to understand everything we could about the reptilian overlordship because we knew it was having a malign influence on human race, uh, the human race and human culture, human society, human civilization, and now it's all coming out. Uh, this reptilian mentality, the reptilian agenda is, is manifesting in so many different ways now. The, uh, the grooming of children in the schools, the uh, it just goes on and on. The constant gaslighting, the uh, everything that is given, just about everything that's, no, I wouldn't say given, but provided for the public, has some kind of toxic uh, side effect that was, in all likelihood, an intended result. Whether it's something you ingest, a food, a pharmaceutical, the air we breathe because of all the chemtrailing, etc., etc. Uh, this is a closed system. This is this is a, a vast planetary farm and and it's harvest time baby it's just as people fatten the thanksgiving turkeys and they uh they fatten the hogs and and what have you uh, for the slaughter well that's what's been going on here on the, this planet and uh, combined with the de-evolution of, of humanity this latest iteration this latest variant if you will <laughs> of humanity, uh, for the most part, is a de-evolved, uh, neurologically impaired, uh, spiritually cut off uh, version 
almost a simulation, if you will, of, of what the human race is supposed to be like. Uh, it's going to get to the point where the only ones who survive this, all this, are, are the conspiracy theorists because they're the ones who do the actual research and investigations. And these de-evolved humans, these de-evolved human variants, uh, they just robotically, in true auto automaton fashion, just follow orders, do what they're told, and they're just being stampeded off of a cliff. And to suggest that there's only humans are behind this, that no other non-human force could possibly be involved, that, that's nonsense. And, and those who still push that, uh, I, I won't come out and say they're my enemy. I uh, don't want to sound that spiteful or vindictive, but I will say they're at least, in my book, an enemy combatant, okay? Because the information is there. And if these people are suffering from some kind of intellectual limitation, neurological impairment, spiritual immaturity, or just plain cowardice, because they don't want to delve into this, and it's like too much work for them, and they have this preconceived bias, and it's all nonsense anyway, and where did that preconceived bias come from? It came from this, this genetic de-evolution process I'm talking about, where they can't process the simplest forms of information. So to me, it's gotten to the point where a lot of these so-called truthers who, who rubbish and marginalize uh, the existence of the reptilians, they are striving to dismiss the very uh, players that are behind all this, in large measure, behind all this. So I want you to think about this, dear listeners. Are they your allies or are they your enemies? And I'm not trying to make it us versus them, George W., you're either with us or you're against us. But it's getting to the point where, uh, long since been the case for me, that these naysayers out there who call themselves truthers, when they're dismissive of the reptilians, when they're dismissive of alien abductions, when they're, when they're dismissive of the alien, long-standing alien presence, malign alien presence on this planet, uh, to me, they're no different than, than a vax hole or, or, or a mask hole. Uh, they become part of the problem, right? And I want to make that very clear. Uh, that's fine if you don't believe in aliens and reptilians, fine. But don't get on a soapbox and try to big shot everyone into saying that that's just disinformation, that's just a distraction. When I know damn well you haven't s spent one nanosecond studying the available information because you don't have the neurological circuitry to even understand any of it, let alone have the guts to, to, to delve into those dark corners. And uh, like I said, later on in this podcast, especially in the member segment, I'll, I'll do a deep dive into the dark elements of this, uh, absolutely proving that it's, it's reptilian and archontic, non-human in nature, this long-standing genetic hybridization uh, to create more than just one strand of this de-evolved cheapanoid uh, variant that you know we, we see all around us, but within uh, the human population at large, uh, you know, certain hybridized strains were intended to be the ruling elite of this planet, the middle managers, the hybrid plantation managers. Okay, so I just want to get that off my chest, but, but I'm going to delve into issues of artificial intelligence, how it all ties in, the aromatic ghost in the machine aspect, uh, talk about the iron content of uh, and the synthetic iron aspect of it, and, and much more. So, anyhow, uh, away we go. First off, I'll tell you my feelings about the AI rollout we're seeing and its origins. I will come right out and say it. AI and the uh, increasing drive towards singularity... Uh, of AI. This is that aromatic alien demiurge in action. I want people to stop and think and put this into perspective when people think, oh, this is only humans that are behind this. The Wright brothers only got off the ground December 17th, 1903. It is December 28th, 2021. Uh, a scant 118 years 
after the Wright brothers got off the ground and were already at the stage where all these chimeras are being <laughs> given to people in the form of treatments, all these weird hydra thingies and graphene and nanobots and hydrogel and all that stuff. And and again, it, it, it pays to do the research about Roswell and also... Um, at the time, still considered a very controversial book. I don't see what's so controversial about it. Controversial about it. Uh, the Day After Roswell, which to me was an instant classic. It was written by the late uh, Colonel Philip Corso. And The Day After Roswell and his own experiences, uh, seeing alien bodies in the wake of the events in New Mexico, as I've stated before, there was more than one crash, which perhaps accounted for the fact that there were you know, a large number of bodies, right? We know that uh, Colonel Henderson, uh, who commanded the transport wing at Walker Army Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico, home of the 509th Bomb Wing, the world's only atomic strike force at the time. Colonel Henderson, we know he flew uh, some of the bodies from Roswell Walker Army Air Force Base to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. Incidentally, interestingly, that's where I think the Wright brothers came from, Dayton, the ball places. But, uh, Pappy Henderson, Pappy was his nickname, flew the bodies from, at least some of them, from Roswell to Wright Field, later Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is at the center of so much of the UFO research and lore. So, the military doesn't like to put all of its eggs in one basket. And, like I said, there were more than one crash, and there was more than one crash site, so... And the military not wanting to put all of its eggs in one basket, it doesn't surprise me at all that Philip Corso would describe a scenario where a truck convoy of, of, of military vehicles would stop at a military base en route to its final destination. And if memory serves, uh, in Philip Corso's case that was Fort Riley, Kansas. Again, if memory serves, it's been years since I read the book. So that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, if they put all the alien bodies in one plane and then it crashed, well, there goes your biological specimens. At, at least, you know, what, what you're able to recover uh, was not as good as the, um, the specimens that were sent out before the crash in, in our hypothetical example, right? So it makes perfect sense to me that the military would place some of the bodies, uh, alien bodies, into a truck convoy and send them separately to whatever destination, perhaps right field, right? So that part is believable enough. Secondly, we must take into account that uh, although there may have been an overall guiding hand from, from the military uh, scientific perspective, if there was two or more crash sites, separate orders would have gone out from the highest authorities. And the uh, truck convoy personnel that are transporting, that were transporting the bodies by road that made a pit stop at Fort Riley, Kansas, they would have had no need to know that bodies were being separately flown out by uh, Colonel Henderson uh, from Walker Field, Roswell, straight to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, the people in the truck convoy would have had no need to know that. Uh, the bodies could have come from different crashes within that same time frame. So, Corso's story about transporting body, uh, of looking into a crate and seeing an alien body and uh, the, the truck convoy was passing through Fort Riley, Kansas, on the way to somewhere else, right? That, that part is eminently believable to me. 
And then he goes further in his story and states that uh, as a uh, top-level staff member of, uh, if memory serves, General Arthur Trudeau's staff, who was the head at the time of uh, Army Research and Development, and as a result of being on General Trudeau's staff, Philip Corso, Colonel Philip Corso, became acquainted with some of the material that was recovered at Roswell. Uh, physically acquainted with it. In fact, he was tasked by General Trudeau to take some of this material, alien technology, and seed it into private industry, to seed it into the research and development centers, to seed it into the universities without telling the recipients the provenance of this material, where it came from, what it is. He was instructed by General Trudeau to just give it to these people and let them do what they will with it and let them develop the patents out of it, let them develop the applications for it, right? And the point of relevance to our discussion is some of this alien technology had to do with uh, fiber opt what we now know as fiber optics, as microprocessors, as um, fuel sources. A, a variety of materials was given over to private industry and to some of the universities, which were privately funded. All right, so this dovetails what we're, with what we're talking about, the the AI aspect, the advanced computing aspect of this and. It must be pointed out that Roswell and the aftermath of Roswell, because the book was called The Day After Roswell, was not the be-all and end-all of Colonel Corso's career. Colonel Corso, this is the same Colonel Corso who testified uh, before, uh, I think it was a select Senate Intelligence Committee or Congressional Inquiry about MIAs, Missing in Action Americans. Uh, that were held captive by the communist uh, post the Vietnam War. Uh, he went on record saying, yes, they're still there, right? And he wasn't the only one. G General Eugene Tai, if memory serves, Tai, T-I-G-H-E, was the director of uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, if memory serves. And he, he said straight up, yes, there are still... Americans held captive in Southeast Asia after World War II. This was a very, very sensitive, hot-button topic. Uh, and it dovetails in all these black ops covert aspects, uh, CIA drug trafficking, etc., etc. Uh, if you remember when uh, Ross Perot, and we could probably use a guy like Ross Perot again, uh, he was concerned about the MIAs and actually, I believe, with the encouragement or tacit approval of the Defense Intelligence Agency, provided the funding, some of the funding, uh, that paid for privately funded uh, intelligence gathering missions in Southeast Asia to determine once and for all if there were uh, Americans left behind as missing in action prisoners of war, MIAs, POWs. And uh, Ross Perot actually had a discussion with um, Army Special Forces legend James Bo Greitz about this very subject. Right. So, again, cycling back to Philip Corso, the UFO Roswell issue was not the only highly sensitive subject he was involved with, although it was the highest level one, uh, to be sure, but the whole issue of uh, MIAs, POWs left behind in Southeast Asia, uh, I mean, people were knocked off and assassinated for knowing too much about that. So keep that in mind when, when you think about uh, the late Philip Corso, that he had his fingers in, in many different pies. And if you can find that book, Day After Roswell, read it, because he talks, goes into detail about how he seeded a lot of this technology, alien technology, 
some of from the Roswell uh, crash retrievals into private industry. And he may not have been the only one to do that. So fast forward to today, and we have all these issues now with this looming AI singularity, and it must be understood that AI, as we know it, this ghost in the machine, wetico, demiurge, aromatic force in the guise of this artificial intelligence, it's, it's been here all along. It's been in our galaxy, it's been in our cosmos, it's been in our plane of existence all along. It was these alien forces that we've been talking about that brought it here, okay? So, again, this ties in with Philip Corso, his delivering materials, technology, including uh, presumably technology, alien technology, dealing with mi what we now know as microprocessors, integrated circuits, fiber optics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because things that we understand or the concept of from our human perspective things like that were recovered in in these crash sites uh, these alien crash retrieval sites and eventually they make their way into private industry here are a couple of articles i want to read from because i i think that they make interesting reading they'll also read uh, an abstract about how the materials within the treatments, they have the potential, and we've talked about this, and, and my colleagues and I were not the only ones that have talked about this, but uh, from the beginning of this whole scamdemic, we've been talking about, we made a point of talking about how the nanotech within the treatments is some kind of a transceiver, a sender and receiver of information. And we, we were saying that from the beginning. Well, I'll read a abstract, uh, a scientific paper talking about that very thing. Uh, they're called Electromagnetic Based Wireless Nanosensors Network Ar Architectures and Applications. So Electromagnetic Based Wireless Nanosensors Network, basically, some of the ingredients of these treatments have the means to be a wireless nanosensors network, and I'll, I'll go into detail about that. But, but first, about this looming uh, singularity and uh, how the powers that be are looking for a common cause with China to develop a standardized policy for artificial intelligence. Uh, they're trying to, in their words, avoid an artificial intelligence arms race. So they think the best thing to do, and uh, surprise, surprise, uh, companies like Blackstone is heavily involved in this. And I just had Judith Quoba on the show, and she was talking about Blackstone. And I'm also going to talk about one of the uh, corporations that are pushing a lot of the AI that's deeply involved with uh, civilian and military intelligence all over the world. And I'll get into that in a moment. Okay, this article is from the last American Vagabond dot com and uh, the subject title is The Real Reason Why Blackstone is Courting the Pentagon. This this is actually written in August twenty twenty, so it was uh during the waning days of the Trump administration, right? So I'm just going to skim through the first part involving Trump and then just get down to the nitty-gritty about this uh, article because uh, it it's very important. Okay. Uh, the Byline, August 19th, 2020 by Whitney Webb. And Whitney Webb has written some outstanding articles about Galan... Maxwell, Robert Maxwell, the Eps Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, if there's one person that knows all about that, it's this gal, Whitney Webb. Anyway, uh, she wrote the article, The Real Reason Why Blackstone is Courting the Pentagon. The sudden push by Wall Street's largest private equity firm 
to heavily lobby the Pentagon and State Department for largely unspecified reasons as part of an increasingly visible conflict within the U.S. establishment regarding how to handle the artificial intelligence arms race. One of Wall Street's largest private equity firms, the Blackstone Group, has been making a series of moves that have left mainstream analysts puzzled, with the most recent being Blackstone's hire of David Urban, a Washington lobbyist with close ties to the Trump administration. Blackstone's courting of a Trump ally was not surprising, surprising given that the firm's CEO, Stephen Schwartzman, recently donated $3 million to Trump's re-election efforts and had previously chaired the president's now-defunct strategic and policy form of business leaders and advisors. The close ties that have developed between Schwartzman and Trump following the latter's election in late 2016 have led mainstream media to describe Schwartzman as a confidant of the president. So what we have here is a, is a guy who's hired by Blackstone to get into Trump's ear and push certain agendas, certain narratives having to do with artificial intelligence, right? And it's yet, yet again another example of them playing both sides against the middle. I'm sure that um, Blackstone had similar feelers out to the, um, the Digital Joe uh, usurper administration, uh, soon to be. Uh, further on in the article... Uh, however, what was odd about Blackstone's hiring of David Urban was its murky reason for doing so, as the firm plans to task Urban with lobbying the Pentagon and State Department on issues related to military preparedness and training. This is odd, as CNBC noted, because Blackstone doesn't have any publicly listed government contracts, and its known investments don't appear to have direct links to the defense industry. However, Urban has extensive experience in dealing with both departments in addition to his close ties to the current administration and the fundraising apparatus of the Republican Army. So it was an overt attempt by Blackstone to get its hooks, its tentacles, into the State Department and the Defense Department. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, though CNBC was left looking for answers... As to Blackstone's sudden interest in aiding the Pentagon with military preparedness and wooing the State, Bar State Department, the likely motive may be related to other recent moves made by the company, such as the hire of former Amazon and Microsoft executive Christine Feng, F-E-N-G. Feng, who was hired by Blackstone on August 3rd, previously led data and, analytical and analytics mergers and acquisitions at Amazon's web services, AWS, which is a contractor to the U.S. intelligence community and other U.S. federal agencies. Previously, Feng was a senior member of Microsoft's corporate development team. Microsoft recently won lucrative contracts for information technology services and cloud computing for the State Department and Pentagon, respectively. According to Blackstone executives, the decision to hire Feng was made due to her, quote, deep relationships in Silicon Valley and her experience working at Amazon and Microsoft. They also added that her hire was motivated by Blackstone's push to, quote, identify new opportunities to invest and partner with innovative companies reshaping the world, and Blackstone's recent efforts to double down on tech sector investments. Notably, Feng's hire came just a few months after Blackstone had hired Vincent Letary, another tech-focused investor experienced with growth stage tech companies and amid a series of recent investments by Blackstone in tech firms including Health Edge Software and Chinese data center provider 21VNet among others. Schwartzman's Push for Common Governance It strongly appears that Blackstone's recent moves including Urban's Hire are part of the firm's bid to become one of the top, quote, innovative companies reshaping the world, unquote, as the artificial intelligence arm, arms race becomes a key driver in the reshaping of the global economy. Blackstone's Stephen Schwartzman is a key part of the relatively tight-knit group 
of billionaires and influential political figures like Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt is the former Google CEO that are working to create a global compact on the research, introduction, and deployment of AI. Create a global compact, a global arrangement. Schwartzman argued for greater global collaboration on AI-driven technologies, particularly between the U.S. and China. Uh, in a July 2020 op-ed for Yahoo Finance, where he wrote that the establishment of, quote, a common governance structure, common, common governance structures, unquote, for the research introduction and deployment of AI is necessary if, quote, we are to avoid the negative consequences of AI. Yeah, like they really care about that. Ultimately, comparing the current pace of development of AI to that of past arms races, such as those involving nuclear and biological weapons. Per Schwartzman, these, quote, common governance structures, unquote, would produce, quote, explicit global commitments, agreements, and eventually international laws with consequences for violation that relate directly to AI and its use. Blackstone's head is convinced that these common governance structures should be built between the U.S. and China. Hence, his heavy investment in universities and artificial intelligence education in both countries. For instance, Schwartzman created the Schwartzman Scholars Program in 2016, where around 100 to 200 students from around the world pursue a master's degree in global affairs at Tsinghua University in Beijing annually. The official goal of the program which was modeled after the Rhodes Scholars Program, is to create a growing network of global leaders that will build strong ties between China and the rest of the world. The program's advisors include former Secretary of State's Henry Kissinger, Condoleezza Rice, and Colin Powell, and former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. I think Colin Powell has recently carked it, maybe due to the uh, treatments, right? and former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, as well as former World Bank President James Wolfenson and former US Secretary of the Treasury and Goldman Sachs Executive Henry Paulson. All right? So we're talking about some heavy hitters there. And they're determined to partner up with China. Schwartzman has set up this Rhodes uh, scholarship-like program in, in China to train 100 to 200 students from around the world to pursue a master's degree in global affairs, where they're going to be indoctrinated into all this stuff. Uh, AI, using AI on a global basis, partnered up with China to literally control every aspect of everyone's life. And then you look at the the nanotech aspect, the sending and receiving and the communications aspect of the treatments, the Internet of Things. Uh, and we've had RFID chips for some time now, but uh, when we have the Internet of Things, where even lampposts are spying on people, right? What we're seeing is the making of this dystopic high-tech uh, what Brzezinski referred to as a technocratic state basically right and uh, it's playing out and again go back to Dr. Colonel Philip Corso and probably others like him who seeded some of this alien technology into private industry and when we say private industry basically talking about reptile, Rothschild, Rockefeller, controlled uh, industry, yeah, even way back then. You can see why I brought up the uh, point that the Wright brothers got off the ground December 17th, 1903. Here we are, December 28th, 2021. Uh, that's only about 117, 118 years, folks, and, and you just heard me talk about this article 
that's how far we've come in such a short period of time. Uh, I would argue that just on a normal linear basis without any external or internal, what I mean by internal also is so many of these R&D types, scientists, mad scientists, they themselves are hybrids, they themselves are adepts, some of them actual warlocks and, and uh, sorcerers. I mean, uh, the guy who allegedly blew himself up in, in, in his lab, uh, founder of the Jet Propulsion Lab, protege of Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons, right? He, he, that's just one example of a guy who is an adept. He, the, uh, he formed his own lodge along with L. Ron Hubbard. He was basically a black magician, okay? And to this day, JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs, are major players. Uh, also, as, as far as concealing a lot of the telemetry that came back from the space probes uh, to Mars and elsewhere, they're major players. And, and the guy who founded JPL was a warlock himself. I mean, come on. So when I say internal, that's what I mean. The sub Rosa was there all along, hybridized bloodlines. Many of these uh, hybrid adepts wind up in the sciences, wind up in the R&D centers. And then you, you have the external uh, element where this outside alien influence and the technology that the aliens bring with them or seed otherwise because I I've put out the notion that what if what if Roswell in particular was a form of gifting what what if it was a Trojan horse operation by the aliens or the reptilians using one or more ET races to basically jumpstart the uh, deep black what eventually became this alien AI program in conjunction with a lot of the hybrids that were already in the military intelligence community uh, in uh, the uh, defense research establishment, scientific uh, establishment with, with deep military intelligence ties, there were already a lot of hybrid types in there anyway. So suddenly Roswell happens and suddenly they're suddenly gifted with all this technology, right? Uh, and with the uh, alien influence externally and then the the sub rosa hybridized bloodlines within this system within the ins institutions guiding the development of these technologies and uh, you know look at the names i just read to you of the, the people the, the shakers and movers uh, behind this blackstone effort kissinger condoleezza rice i mean those are big time lizard people okay that's not a coincidence. Uh, to read further from the article, and I'll provide a link to this article as well. Uh, this last paragraph makes for interesting reading as well. Last May, a federal commission that Schmidt chairs called the National Security Commission on AI produced a document that was obtained by a FOIA request earlier this year. Again, this is Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. Okay. Last May, a federal commission that Schmidt chairs called the National Security Commission on AI, NSCAI, produced a document that was obtained by a FOIA request earlier this year. One particularly important page made a point that was essentially repeated in Schwartzman's July op-ed regarding a global AI compact, titled, quote, The Importance of a U.S.-China AI Cooperation. It begins with a quote from Kissinger, a key advisor and a, quote, great friend of Schmidt about the need for, quote, arms control negotiation for AI. Arms control is, I mean, that's like a Freudian slip, I guess, because that's implying that this is like weaponized AI. Uh, we need to have an arms control negotiation for the AI. Well, arms control, the AI is armed, it's, it's weaponized, right? And, and it thinks for itself, uh, great. You know, I've seen this in movies, right? <laughs> and then states that, quote, the future of AI will be decided at the intersection of private enterprise and policy leaders between China and the U.S., end quote. 
In other words, the Schmidt Shared NSC AI argues that the future of AI will be determined by the political leaders and business leaders of China and the U.S. Here's another thing, too. You come across these so-called truthers that just downplay and minimize China, right? And they go, oh, they're making a big deal about China again. China is nothing. China is like yada, yada, yada. They, they don't understand the game plan, right? They, they really don't. Anyone who is dismissive or marginalizes China's role in this is either a piss poor investigator or is uh, a shill or a disinformation artist. Okay. And let me get back to the article. The future of AI will be decided at the intersection of private enterprise and policy leaders between China and the U.S. In other words, the Schmidt Shared NSC AI argues that the future of AI will be determined by the political leaders and business leaders of China and the U.S. The page also adds that we, the United States, risk being left out of the discussions where norms around AI are set for the rest of our lifetimes. Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, and Microsoft will not be, end quote. This is particularly significant given that NSCAI is tasked with making recommendations to the federal government regarding how to move forward with AI regulations within the context of national security. And this is coming up again and again. Cybersecurity, cybersecurity, cybersecurity. We hear it all the time and, and cyber attacks. And uh, now corporations of all sizes are getting in on the act of in the guise of cybersecurity, the potential exists. They're going to let this AI in all over the place uh, with companies that have no stake or interest in the national security environment because they're so caught up in the narratives of cybersecurity, right? That they're going to be swept up in this whole AI avalanche. Regarding how to move forward with AI regulations within the context of national security and its members include key members of the Pentagon, U.S. intelligence community, and Silicon Valley behemoths that double as contractors to the U.S. military, U.S. intelligence, or both. One of the NSC AI's interests per the FOIA obtained document is the use of AI in diplomacy. Oh, that's great suggesting that it also seeks to explore potential State Department uses for AI. Notably, earlier this year and a year after the aforementioned NSC AI document was written, the State Department saw key aspects of its IT infrastructure privatized and given over to NSC AI link companies like Microsoft. Surprise, surprise. And we know what comes out of the State Department, right? Uh, this embrace of communist totalitarianism and, and all that. Uh, we've seen the bitter fruit of what their, uh, their bureaucrats and staffers and, uh, you know, intellectual wonks are all about because we keep seeing the bitter fruit you know, play out over and over and over. And the State Department is overrun by CFR types and, and, and Marxists and communists. So if, if that's what they're like, uh, the, the personnel, to put it kindly, in that agency, what's the AI going to be like that caters to them specifically, right? I shudder to think. So in, in broad outline, and thank you for you know, indulging me, uh, I'll, like I said, I'll provide a link to that article because it, it bears repeating. When you have heavy hitters like, you know, Kissinger and people like that, and James Wolfen, Wolfenson, former head of the World Bank, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they're all behind this, and they're openly stating that we want cooperation with China to establish the norms of a worldwide artificial intelligence security framework, okay? And again... A scant 100, 17, 118 years after the Wright brothers got off the ground, we're talking about this now. Uh, we're, we're talking about scientific, technical, technological achievements 
that are, are, are geometric in progression. These are not linear advances, folks. Okay, this is not like, you know, building blocks. Uh, bit by bit. This is like going forward in leaps and bounds. Okay? And I'll um, read from a couple more articles and then make some comments and then uh, get into some other key issues here as well. Okay, here's an interesting article. It's called Dark Trace and Cyber Reason. The intelligence front companies seeking to subjugate the world with the AI singularity. Meet two power cybersecurity companies riddled with American, British, and Israeli intelligence agents who plan on using AI technology to target foreign populations as well as their own. By Johnny Vedmore, this is from Unlimited Hangout with Whitney Webb. And what's the dateline? Uh, November 3rd, 2020. So this is like over a year old. Uh, we're now at a point in history where either the coming events will be studied for thousands of years or it will be remembered as the point where we lost our humanity completely. Artificial intelligence technology has entered a new phase over the past several years where instead of the AI algorithms learning from humans, they are now teaching themselves, changing their own algorithms as they learn. We are on the cusp of letting go of control entirely, so early on, because of a, of a few small companies who have quietly been given free reign under the guise of protecting, there they go again, protecting our digital lives, all within a tech sector that is moving so fast that we can no longer see what's just around the bend. And every time I see cybersecurity, every time I see articles warning about the next big cyber attack, this is where I think they're going to introduce a rollout en masse, uh, the AI. Further down in the article, it reads... We are about to experience a mon monumental change in technology starting with, quote, next generation, unquote, cybersecurity that will then move quickly into the unknown. Unsupervised AI now running on critical networks throughout the world as a, quote, cybersecurity, unquote, product is evolving its own algorithms without the need for humans to be involved. Meanwhile, the, he the wealthy patrons funding this cutting edge future tech are out in force working to propel our societies into this new, unexplored, and dystopian technological frontier. But who are the companies that these eager, wealthy venture capitalists are funding to create an autonomous, AI-powered cyber defense system like nothing before? Are they even companies at all when we consider their deep and direct ties to intelligence agencies? Should these firms instead be reclassified as simply extensions of state intelligence apparatus acting without the restrictions of public accountability. And I will provide a link for this article because it, it's worth reading on its own. Each of these companies have been, have been built by teams of former intelligence operatives, some of whom have sat in the highest echelons of the intelligence apparat, apparati of their respective countries, MI5 and CIA, both carry considerable weight in these sinister-sounding enterprises, but it is Israel's Unit 8200 that are the main group capitalizing on this advance into the world-altering realm of unsupervised artificial intelligence algorithms. And we've talked in the past about Unit 8200. Yet these very companies appear to be selling a defense against a potential apocalypse that they themselves may be responsible for. Problem, reaction, solution. They have the solutions to everyone's cyber woes, or at least that's the image they wish to put, portray. Let me, introduce, let me introduce you to the most dangerous intelligence operations masquerading as cybersecurity companies on planet Earth. One of them is called Dark Trace. Why don't they just call themselves Dark Crystal or something, you know? Dark Trace, the unsupervised machine learning AI cybersecurity solution. The members of Dark Trace are open about their aims. They talk about publicly held data as they already as though they already have the rights to sell it to anyone around the world. Data is the fuel of the fourth industrial revolution and Dark Trace has made almost two billion dollars in a data business during its relatively short history. Okay, further down the track, uh, 
Dark Trace is already active within the, uh, the NHS, the UK power grid, and many other major parts of Britain's critical infrastructure, and they are rapidly expanding around the globe, uh, NHS being the national health system. Dave Palmer was an MI5 anti-terror agent working on the 2012 London Olympics when he and some of his colleagues first, first bashed out the initial idea for what would become Dark Trace. They wanted to create an AI cybersecurity system that was based on the human immune system. Very interesting. A system that differed from the traditional reactive antivirus software approach. This system would look for abnormalities in a computer network's processes to target a wider range of more sophisticated cyber issues. Palmer had spent 14 years working for MI5 and GCHQ, that's Government Communications Headquarters, the uh, UK counterpart to the NSA. They work hand in glove, of course. Palmer had spent 14 years working for MI5 and GCHQ in a role creating secure networks for British spies to communicate. He would eventually approach two mathematicians from Cambridge University to help make his dreams reality at the, at the tail end of 2012. These mathematicians were working on projects related to using unsupervised machine learning to teach a computer to have a sense of self, a step that would bring such technology dangerously close to the so-called singularity. At that point, as critics and proponents of self-aware AI alike have warned, that machine intelligence will not only surpass human intelligence, but advance at an incomprehensible rate which major with major and world altering implications. Boy howdy. Further down in the article, Dark Trace boasts that over four thousand organizations worldwide now rely on Dark Trace's AI technologies, with headquarters in San Francisco, US and Cambridge, UK. Dark Trace has over 1,300 employees spread across 44 countries, and their numbers are rising. And although the connections to the state intelligence agencies are clear and obvious, Dark Trace is officially a completely private enterprise with big investors including KKR, Summit Partners, Vitruvian Partners, Samsung Ventures, 1011 Ventures, Hoxton Ventures, and a number of other um, partners. One of the first members appointed to Dark Trace's advisory board was Jonathan Evans, also referred to as Baron Evans of Weirdale. Of Evans was previously the Director General of MI5, taking over from Dame Eliza Manningham Buller in 2007 and staying in the most senior intelligence role that the UK has to offer until 2013. After his time as head of MI5, again MI5 is the uh, security service for the... UK, uh, equivalent to the FBI. Evans initially joined S HSBC Holdings as a non-executive director, a role he also took up at ARC, a highly secure UK data center. If you were to walk into the advisory boardroom at Dark Trace, you could be forgiven for thinking that you were actually attending a UK home office meeting from the past. The former Home Secretary under Prime Minister Theresa May, Amber Rudd, became part of Dark Trace after her time in government ended in 2019. She is also on the advisory team of Teneo, a consulting firm co-founded and led by Doug Band, the former advisor to Bill Clinton and close friend of the infamous Jeffrey Epstein. As always, when investigating the murky world of intelligence, many connections to Epstein and his partner Galan Maxwell are revealed. With that being said, Yet another member of Dark Trace Advisory Board also has Epstein Maxwell links. The CIA stalwart Alan Wade is one of the most interesting members of the Dark Trace Advisory Team. He was announced as joining their growing advisory board on 10 May 2016 and had been the former Chief Information Officer of the Central Intelligence Agency. His 35-year career at the top echelons of the CIA ended in 2006 and afterwards he would dedicate his time to assisting companies with CIA links from the private sector. While he had been at one of the top posts in the entire U.S. intelligence community, Wade co-founded Chiliad alongside Galan Maxwell's sister, Christine Maxwell. As Unlimited Hangout reported earlier this year, Christine Maxwell was personally involved in leading the operations of the front company, 
used by Robert Maxwell to market the Promise software. There we go again with the Promise software. Whole backstory with that. Um, Danny Casalero, the octopus. Danny Casalero was assassinated, suicided for investigating that. Uh, Promise software, which had a backdoor for Israeli intelligence to both the U.S. public and private sectors. In practice, that meant a number of virtually all of the federal agencies in America and in other countries. Given this history, it is certainly telling that Wade would choose to co-found a major software company with Christine Maxwell, of all people. When it was still active as a company, Chiliad described itself as, quote, the leader in data analysis across clouds, agencies, departments, and other stovepipes, and it ran on the computers and databases of nearly every major national security system in the U.S. government. But nowadays, its defunct website gives us just the standard error message. Very interesting. Con continuing. Uh, rounding out the Dark Trace Advisory Board is their token academic, Professor Nick Jennings, C-B-F-R-E-N-G, I guess those are honorific titles, who serves the Vice Provost for Research and Enterprise at Imperial College London. Yet Jennings has also been the UK's government's, the UK government's Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security and is currently a member of the UK government's AI Council, a very convenient position to hold given Dark Trace's ambitions. These characters that comprise Dark Trace's leadership, Dark Trace, Dark Crystal, and board stand ready to put forward a solution to all of our problems related to cybersecurity. Geez, I wish they would stop trying to protect us all the time. <sighs> Here is the other corporation, and I've spoken about these guys before, Cyber Reason, from offensive state-sponsored hackers to AI cybersecurity. Cyber Reason CEO and co-founder is an enigmatic former Israeli intelligence agent Lior Div Cohen, often simply referred to as Lior Div, Div, an IDF Medal of Honor recipient and former Israeli Unit 8200 member, co-founded Cyber Reason in 2012 alongside Yassi Nar and Yonatan Striam Ahmed, who are also fellow veterans of Israel's military cybersecurity corps. A scholar from the Academic College of Tel Aviv, Lior Div afterwards worked as a software engineer for ZACT, X-A-C-C-T, a network service provider followed by, the, followed by the notorious firm Amdocs, which was accused of eavesdropping on American government officials on behalf of Israel. In between Amdocs and Cyber Reason, Lior Div was the CEO and co-founder of Israeli cybersecurity firm AlphaTech, which is described in its national media as a cybersecurity services company for Israeli government officials. Now, they're deeply connected with Lockheed Martin and a number of major um, aerospace defense contractors, the giant ones. I spoke about Cyber Reason before. They're, they're the ones that ran the, the, the simulation okay, of how to disrupt the elections. If, if you remember that podcast where they, they hacked into the... Uh, the transportation service remotely manipulated uh, a city bus and made it run over a bunch of people uh, standing in line uh, waiting to uh, to vote. Uh, they muck with the traffic lights. They turn loose uh, some d domestic terrorists. I mean, the whole nine yards. And basically, they, they canceled the election. They were showing how easy it could be done, right? It was called uh, uh, Operation Blackout. Uh, I'll read a little bit about that, uh, just to refresh people's memories. Nolandia, the fictional city which was ground zero during Operation Blackout, was based on an average American city nestled with a, within a crucial swing state on Election Day. Here in Nolandia, three teams of cyber fighters would battle with each other over control of the city. These would be the three teams, each with succinct, succinct roles in the polling day pretense as told to us by Cyber Reasons Ross Rustici and Sam Curry. Red Team, a.k.a. Broken Eagle Task Force. The basic aim of the Broken Eagles Task Force was to disrupt the election processes in real time. The Reds' approach evolved throughout the simulation from causing as much harm as they could 
into making the result of the election of the election as in doubt and politically biased as possible. They attempted to control the narrative that the system was broken and that the elections could not be trusted. Blue Team, a.k.a. Nolandi Event Task Force. The Blues were fundamentally reactive during the simulation and were constantly on the back foot. The Blues responding to a reported gas leak at a Nolandia polling station early in the scenario, a gas leak at a Nolandia polling station, contacted the Secretary of State's office to ask whether they needed to close the polling station. Luckily, the real State Department had two advisors sitting in on the simulation who were able to offer alternative contingency plans that existed in real-world America. By the end of the simulation, the Blues were all aware that they had largely failed the exercise. And the White Team, a.k.a. White Control Team. This team acted as support to give advice or permission to either team in a role very much like the Dungeon Master in a D&D game. The White's main task was to balance the realism of the scenario and create problems for either team that they'd experience in the real world. In November 2019, Cyber Reason reran their Election Day attack simulation at an event in Washington, D.C. and have run f- multiple simulations over the last year. The last imagined American city was called Adversaria. As the Election Day creeps ever closer, Cyber Reason ha- have been releasing its more well-produced pra- well promo videos online. Uh, if, you're paying, if you're paying very close attention, then you will have noticed that Cyber Reason have spent all of October 2020 marketing heavily as their big day approaches. Uh, representatives of Cyber Reason are being quoted in every mainstream scare story out there. Uh, so, you know, they're the ones that put out the stories about hospitals have become prime targets for crippling ransomware attacks, uh, where they quote uh, Israel Barak, uh, Cyber reasons chief information security officer etc 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 so just as uh, you know companies put the threat out there that unless you get our security services uh, cyber security etc etc you're likely to be attacked by some ransomware uh, kind of attack problem reaction solution big time right and their articles appeared all over uh, the internet, the print, electronic media. And, you know, they promote themselves as, you know, the defenders, right? Well, again, they ran that simulation and they caused so much havoc in the scenario that the elections were basically uh, canceled. So these are two major players in the AI world. And they're really pushing everything towards this singularity that we've been talking about. Their board of directors, especially for Dark Trace slash Dark Crystal, is a who's who of big shots in the intelligence security world. So these are major players that we're talking about. And I always go back to the point that so many of these individuals that are deeply involved with this at all levels, they're hosts, a lot of them. They're part of this reptilian, alien, hybridized variant, if you will, of humanity. They look like humans, but they're not quite human. They're plugged into this hive consciousness, Borg collective mentality, consciousness, which compels them to do things like this, right? They want to set up a system whereby artificial intelligence, super advanced, super fast machine learning eventually takes over all systems and makes up his own mind along the way, making decisions which radically impact key important infrastructure nodes and also the responses for such problems. It'll create the problems and then it'll come up with the solutions to these problems which inevitably will mean more restrictions, less freedom and at some point this AI will decide okay well uh, you know there are these undesirables 
so-called that are causing all these problems in society and then take your pick right you know white people in general <laughs> gun owners people who have constitutional values I remember when they inverted all this with that movie Eagle Eye where this supercomputer AI system looked for any potential threat against the Constitution and just destroyed everything I mean it just no matter where the protagonist in the movie went AI uh, the AI Eagle Eye system was already there destroying everything it deemed as a threat to the Constitution so in a very basic way, what they did was they planted in the minds of the gullible viewers uh, the notion that, oh, Constitution equals, like, evil destruction, right? Because Eagle Eye was destroying anything that was a threat to the Constitution. So to the simple-minded viewers watching this, oh, well, the Constitution must be a bad thing because this evil eye, uh, Eagle Eye uh, system, in its zeal to protect the Constitution, is wiping everything out, right? So that was just their backhanded way of saying, this is what we have in mind. Uh, but in the movie, they make it seem as if they're protecting the Constitution, right? Go figure. I'm going to talk more about these issues. I'm going to talk more about the uh, more overt reptilian aspects of this uh, in the members section. I talked a little longer than I wanted to in this first segment, but I had to get some key points across. A lot of people know that the AI infrastructure is already in place. I just wanted to point out the, the, the likely, in all probability, certain certainty that the origins of the AI is alien in nature. Again, Wright Brothers got off the ground December 17th, 1903. Here we are December 29th, uh, 2021, and this is what we're talking about, okay? This is a non-linear progression. It's a geometric progression. The technology and know-how were already there in the cosmos. Already there. It was brought here. Right? And if you read some of those majestic papers that the, the, the Wood Father and Son team have amassed, there's a lot of information out there that seem to me to, to have come from legitimate uh, intelligence and military documents leaked out talking about the potential windfall as far as exploiting the alien technology for a variety of purposes even up to the point of exploiting the, the alien biology the cadavers that were recovered and how a bio-warfare weapons could be produced as a result of an analysis of the alien bodies in some of the majestic, majestic papers the documents revealed that uh, some of the people who were at the the crash sites and I talked about this before but it bears repeating to round out this this segment that some members of the SED special engineering detachments in the Manhattan Project days in World War II these were the, the military guys that, you know, using specially designed tools, the machining tools, they created the parts, uh, the equipment, and they put it together uh, to make up atomic weapons, right? Uh, and so, not surprisingly, SED, Special Engineering Detachment personnel, were at the crash sites. And according to the Majestic Papers, I have no reason to doubt them, some of them became very ill and died as a result of exposure to something, whether it was in actually uh, some of the contamination had to do with the alien bodies. Something about the alien bodies caused them to become very ill and die. And of course, the way these psychopaths think, oh, well, we can make a bioweapon out of this, right? <laughs> Uh, just their mentality, right? So that that comes out in in the the documentation that, among other things, that how we can exploit this technology, we can use, uh, study the alien bodies and somehow come up with a bio warfare agent for it or agents. Anyhow, reach the end of the uh, first segment of this commentary. Uh, meet the reptilians and artificial intelligence. Part 1, 
if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do at the Cosmic Switchboard Show, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we will see you at the top of the member segment.